Folks, all of you know that Legacy Precious Metals is a great sponsor of the Doug Collins Podcast, and I can't tell you right now a more important time to know Legacy Precious Metals. Uh, there right now, uh, your investment portfolio, if you look at the stock market right now, you look at the inflation that's going on, you look at the uncertainty out there, I'm going to tell you, it, it, the investments that you're making need to have gold and silver to be a part of. You need the precious metals. Uh, navigators are people who have been there, they know what to look out for, and they know how to come back and navigate you through the streams of your financial situation, whether it's for your retirement or whether it's just in your long-term investment strategies. Legacy Precious Metals folks are people who listen. They listen to you, they listen to your needs, and they help you navigate this uncertain financial times. When you're seeing the fluctuation back and forth, people will actually need to find a place where they have a portfolio that is balanced. Having gold and silver in that portfolio is something that you can have as part of yours. Just go find them at LegacyPMInvestments.com. Do you want to listen to a podcast? By who? Georgia GOP Congressman Doug Collins. How, how is it? The greatest thing I have ever heard in my whole life. I could not believe my ears. In this house, wherever the rules are disregarded, chaos and mob rule. It has been said today, where is bravery? I'll tell you where bravery is found and courage is found. It's found in this minority who has lived through the last year of nothing but rules being broken, people being put down, questions not being answered, and this majority say, be damned with anything else. We're going to impeach and do whatever we want to do. Why? Because we won an election. I guarantee you, one day you'll be back in the minority and it ain't going to be that fun. Hey, everybody, it's Doug Collins. It's President's Day, and we're excited today to have uh, John Burlock here with Competitive Enterprise Institute to talk about uh, our first president, George Washington. And But we're going to do it from a little bit different perspective today. John has a, uh, a great perspective on this. He's wrote a book called George Washington, Entrepreneur, How Our Founding Fathers, Private Business Pursuits Changed America and the World. John, welcome to the Doug Collins Podcast. Thanks, uh, Congressman Collins. So good to have. It's so good to be on. That's well, gonna be fun. Let, let, you know, look. So many just talked about our founding fathers today. It's amazing to me how people, you know, no matter what their educational background, you know, they throw up the founding fathers as the founding fathers were this, and I believe the founding fathers were that. There's so much mystique and everything about it. I mean, I have a pastoral background. I have a religious degree. I also have a law degree. You know, it's amazing to me how sometimes today we talk about the founding fathers as if they were all pastors. Well, they were not all pastors. <laughs> you know, they were. You know, they were not all lawyers. They were just a lot of common people. But George Washington, being our first president, being the leader, um, a lot of myths, a lot of things grown up, a lot of truisms. But also, one of the things that I think your book addresses that. Uh, I want to talk about with you today is this he was actually a very bright guy wasn't he he really was he wasn't formally educated past the age of 13 but he because his family his father died when he was 11 and his family couldn't afford to send him to college plus he had to take care of the family take care of the farm but he he both learned from people would always ask questions and he read quite a bit he read everything from books on agriculture from great britain to a adam smith's wealth of nations which was the first book to lay out the theories of uh, of capitalism as opposed to uh, the mercantilism they were practicing in great britain so he was a very educated well-read guy despite the lack of formal schooling you know interesting john i want to talk about it because you're, you're very well schooled as well i mean i've been to uh, you know as my dad was said, I had more degrees than I probably understood, and I, I get that. <laughs> but you know, the the one thing though that that I think is missing, and if you don't mind jumping here, because you said it, he learned by reading and asking questions. Is that a lost art in our? And I'm going to jump to today's world. Is that a lost art in our world today? I there are a lot of people who still read and ask ask questions, but um, uh, as I say in my book, George Washington Entrepreneur. Um, uh, available for sale at Amazon and whenever wherever books are sold. I'm plugging my book to talk about, to talk about books. Um, this is, um, he made an art of it. Uh, I go into one of the examples in my book about how he wanted to build a greenhouse, that they had greenhouses back then, even with the lack of, well, electricity, building material, but it was some greenhouses in Europe and a few around America, but it was very rare. So he would ask everyone he knew in Virginia and they mentioned uh, some people, uh, a Catholic family, the the Carols in uh, in in Maryland. So he wrote to them. He wrote to the widow of of uh, 
of a of a far, of a farmer who had built a greenhouse, and she, and she knew a lot herself, and she corresponded with him, Margaret Carroll. So that's the thing. He would just he would just write and ask questions, almost doing like an interview, whether it's to build in something in in business or uh, uh, on the military or a greenhouse at Mount Vernon, and would also read a great deal about. You know, he was a great horseman. Thomas Jefferson said he was one of the best horsemen. He, he was the best horseman he had ever seen. I mean, they're famous. He's famous for riding into, into battle. But he actually read books, his invoices show of, of the books he ordered from everything from how to care for sick horses to actually make jumps. I mean, that's amazing, you know, just to take that out without the, quote, formal education style. And uh, granted, our educational system has changed dramatically since even back then. But but it is interesting that he, he kept that up and it's something that I think a lot of us could do today. Um, you know, podcasts are becoming a new, you know, I think audio book of life because you hear people and a lot of people are learning from those. And, and that's why we're here today. Um, for someone who, as you was researching this book and getting in ready for it, everybody knows, or not only everybody, but most people know of his uh, military background. They know of his prowess, especially in the Revolutionary War, you know, and, and sort of leading from that. I won't say this, you know, for factually, but there's a lot of times when you look at George Washington, it's sort of the silent sphinx, if you would. Because you, you hear of Madison and Jefferson and Franklin and everybody going off, but then it was always, well, Washington was presiding or Washington was there and then he led. Is is that sort of the, the persona that you, if we were to go back 200 plus years and sit down with George Washington. Is, is that the persona that we would have after meeting with him for an hour? I would say yes and no, and it would kind of be depending on depending on his mood. He certainly did. Um, uh, he was. I mean, he was. He, one of his skills was good listening. He would sit at the Constitution while it was presiding from hours on end. But I believe he did talk to people in between the sessions, and he was certainly a prolific letter writer um, uh, and and quite witty in in the letters. Quite a, a good writer. I was I was I was surprised. He, he, you know, his uh, much of his business correspondence, as opposed to like say the personal correspondence with Martha, which she burned when he passed, which was the which was the custom of the day. It, uh, but the bit, uh, so that's not here for us, but the business correspondence is, is there. And he, you know, you could, he, he was, he had a lot of friendly co- conversation there, but yes, he was a good listener. And he, in fact, he was the one, this is not directly in the constitution, but he created the presidential cabinet with Jefferson and Hamilton, where he would sit there and listen and ask for their opinions. And that's a tradition that of course still continues today. Exactly. Well, he was also the one that sort of, you know, gave except until Roosevelt he sort of gave the tradition of serving two terms and leaving and and, and going back um the 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 whole process around Washington though led leads us back to Mount Vernon it leads us back because he always you know from reading and what I've done on reading and studying and going to Mount Vernon and others he always had this idea that where he that home was his life that was that was his you know world but when he would go out to serve, whether it be in the military or as president or others, it was always to come home to Mount Vernon. Is, is that what you got in, in, in your research and, and before we get into the, some of the business issues? Very, very much so. And, uh, you know, he also sort of gave us the idea of the citizen legislator. He gave up power twice, both when he was when people tried to make him an emperor when he was victorious with the Revolutionary War. But he said, no, I'm, I'm, go, I'm going home. And then he was sort of drafted to be president and went home from that. But he really made Mount Vernon into a show, a show place and, and a place that, you know, was like uh, what, what they might even call an incubator today uh, in venture capital terms with so many business enterprises. I appreciate you mentioned his giving up power. Uh, when I was in Congress, I used to give tours, night tours. And we would always go into the rotunda and I always focus. I said, all these other things are great. I said, but to understand the greatness of America, you have to understand that one painting, which showed Washington giving back his power uh, to the Continental Congress after the the Revolutionary War and saying, I'm going home. Because, and I tried to express it when young uh, folks from college age, I used to do a lot of college tours at night. And I said, I want you to imagine that you're being given basically complete power. You could have done pretty much anything you wanted 
And instead, you wanted to go home and you willingly gave up that power. I said, I said, I, there's very few in the world that would actually do that. Yeah, uh, yes, he he set he set the exam he set the example for that for that and other um uh, and uh, and other and other um representative republics about yeah that people should serve for a limited time. It is wild. Well, let's get into the book. Let's get into to the Washington. Let's uh, talk about it because there's so many things that were going on. Um, we'll just sort of jump in. Where do you want to jump in? Because I think this private business institute and the things that he did with you know intellectual part, but also branding. I mean, there was so much in your book. <clears throat> Let's start unpacking it. Where would you want to start? I would just start to what we were talked about when he was he was a, he was eleven. His father his father passed away. He wasn't you know he was he was a middle he was a middle child in the sense that he had two older uh, step brothers. So he really in, in in those in those days the oldest um, inherited the most. So he didn't really inherit that much as much as her, as his older brothers. He didn't. Um, for instance, um, uh, inherit Mount Vernon initially, it was only when his, you know, he was in his thirties and his brother and all of his brother's heirs, you know, his, his, uh, his brother's like wife and daughter, unfortunately, they all, they all passed within a few, within a few years that he was able to get Mount Vernon. By that time he had, uh, Washington had already built up, a uh, re, uh, uh, he had been a, a real estate speculator, but he started out as a surveyor, just surveying land. And I got to talk to even modern sur day surveyors. And despite you know the GPS equipment, some of the things as far as you know, as far as mapping and taking quality of the land are that much not much di different. But he built sort of a, a reputation as being one of the top surveyors in 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 the colony of Virginia. I mean, he surveyed what is now downtown Alexandria, as well as different, you know, what was then just land being developed in the, as farmland in the Shenandoah Valley. And he, and that's where he sort of built up his reputation. And he had been a surveyor, um, really had done, so, even though it wasn't in, in commercial practice, had, you know, had done surveys really the rest of the rest of his his life, including it periodically at Mount Vernon, but also it gave him, you know, the, knowing the conditions of the battlefields and having a leg a leg up of the British, what some of the land could do. That really gave him some some expertise, knowing land, and then later, you know, knowing real estate. Sometimes as a surveyor, he would get paid in in parcels of land, and he would just he would he would build or he would buy the land some of the land he was he was surveying which wasn't it didn't have clear ownership and he sort of built up a real almost a real estate empire from that i mean that's interesting to know because I mean, surveying is not somebody you just go out and you know doesn't have skills i mean the math the you know the the thought the process there that goes into that is is pretty heavy coming from someone who net didn't have that formal education we talked about it a few minutes ago but that learning uh, you got to have a mind that's pretty quick there Oh, there were several books on, um, and I there was there was a previous book, um, Washington: A Life in Books by uh, Kevin Hayes, that just talked painstakingly traces some of the books he read. Now he did have some education in uh, in mathematics as part of his as part of his tutoring, which we don't know that that much about. Like that, he re did receive some formal education until he was about thirteen. So he read math books there, and he would continue uh, reading about that, reading books about by um, English agronomists, including one of whom was actually named Jethro Tull, and the, the namesake of the band. And uh, he would he would read that about how to how to how to how to grow different things. And then, of course, when he did in, inherit Mount Vernon, and you know, started out there, you know, being um, being married to, to Martha, he saw the uh, that the just the tobacco was not um, good for the soil. Plus, there were d deals with British exports, so he wanted. Uh, and the duties there, so he went in more of a domestic market. So over a couple of years, he converted it completely to wheat, plus really diversified his crop, his crops. And then the wheat became he made a flour mill where he would actually brand his flour with the G. Washington brand, like a hundred years before the famous American uh, man, uh, food manufacturers like H. J. Hines would do that. So just amazing and, and, and a pioneer in so many ways in business practices. That is my for the Doug Collins podcast listener. I mean, John, you've just left an, a, an amazing imprint for those of us who will now look at every Washington uh, portrait or whatever, and then see him in a Jethro Tull concert shirt. That that's uh, yeah. well, <laughs> you know, the funny thing was, I uh, one of the things Jethro Tull wrote wrote about was how to plant uh, 
plant hemp. Um, uh, and, <laughs> and so one of my sub chapters was originally going to be called How Washington Learned to Learned to, <laughs> About Hemp from Jethro Tull. And my editor thought better of it. <laughs> yeah, they'd probably come back on that one. Um, curious, before he gets to Mount Vernon, and, you know, he was surveying, he was doing the thing, of course, you know, the intermix with the military and all. Where was he? Was he basically still living near what is now Mount Vernon or did he come from another? Was he closer to D.C., more the Alexandria uh, part of that? Well, no, he wasn't born in Mount Vernon. He grew up in, uh, in, in uh, he spent mu much of his boyhood in, uh, in Fredericksburg and in what's now called uh, near Fredericksburg and near the Rappahannock River and what's called Ferry Farm, uh, which they have had to... Uh, the, the, his home was uh, had been gone for about 100, 150 years there, and they only just recently re rebuilt the, the boyhood home. But his older brother Lawrence, who did inherit Mount Vernon, sort of served as a as a mentor. So when in his teenage years he he came to Mount Vernon and sort of learned about sort of the uh, uh, what was then the aristocratic um, uh, uh, life, and he was he was in his surveying he was actually. Um, and in other things, he was mentored by the Fairfax family, uh, namesakes of Fairfax County in, in Virginia, Lord Fairfax. And they actually took him uh, up in uh, on, on some of the surveying expeditions. So he sort of he had his foot in both worlds and he he aspired and people when people saw what a good job he was doing as a. Uh, surveying and what just what a nice young man was that people you know did 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 help him out and help help him and help him and ad, advance so so that's uh so he, and then he was in the uh the the what the, the french the french and indian war or the seven years war what you uh um uh called called different things with the where the british were fighting the french over some of the western uh what were then western lands like lands in ohio so that he was doing a, a, a lot of he lived partly in Mount Vernon, but a lot of but some in in like uh, his boyhood home in Fredericksburg, as well as on the really on the battlefield. Exactly. Now that war was also where he had, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't that where he had his we'll call it near death experience, life experience that sort of that he sort of proclaimed or he talked about some that that was the point that that God had a purpose in his life. You know, if they, there was a story about. Uh, that he should have died. The, the the guy was about to shoot him, and the gun didn't go off, and he, that sort of made an impact in his life. I'm not familiar with that particular story. I know he's had several near, near death experiences throughout his uh, throughout his life, but I know he talked very much about providence uh, throughout the life, and and also I I write about that he was sort of of. Uh, uh, a contem uh, part of his his and his mother's religion where they would contemplate God like in a it's it's been called med meditation like say in a table or things like that or look at different objects and, and just use that to contemplate God's work. Interesting. And when he got back to Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon was not just simply a home place or a farm. And you've alluded to this a little bit with some of the branding. What were some of the when he got there and and began to look at it in the meticulous. One of the things that I was always fascinated by was the meticulous detail that he gave to the house and the, and the buildings around it in itself um, in the planning of those. And that was another sort of venture of his, wasn't it? Uh, yes. The, the, uh, I mean, he was, he was, he was quite the, uh, the architect, the mansion house is, uh, I mentioned in the, the, bo uh, the boyhood, um, uh, the, the boyhood home at, at when he, uh, in Fredericksburg had to be rebuilt, but the mansion house at Mount Vernon is still with the Italian piazza, things like uh, just so glamorous is, is you know, it, it pretty much exactly as as he as he had built it. I mean, they've had some new paint jobs and things like that. And, and they've tried to and, and also just some of the some of the things in in uh, in the decoration, like the dining room with the, you know, sort of painted in green. Just he had a lot of. A lot of say, Martha. Martha too uh, was a was a, was a smart lady, but very much in designing Mount Mount Vernon. Some of the fl uh, the flower garden, some of the uh, the uh, the es es espal espalier with the with the trees, which is sort of like the French bonsai, where the trees are are close together. Everything he had, he had a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of say. Uh, I mean, he did a lot of it himself. I, I mentioned the, the greenhouse, but uh, he certainly had a, lot, had a lot of say. 
Yeah, I've read article. I've read you know stories about him that in the middle of that was sort of his relief if it was be riding back to Martha or riding back to the to the workers at, at Mount Vernon saying, okay, what is this doing? How is this coming along? And and he had a very fine detail of of, of precision as to what he wanted to see. The longest letters when he was president, and he was still as a kind of kind of like running an absentee when he was president would say, you know, kind of exactly how high to build the fences, things like that. And you could tell, I mean, he was he was enjoying it, just, just talking about, you know, just thinking about managing the farm and when he would go back there. It is. Uh, explain some of the, because the, the, he had a variety of businesses. He not only had the farm and the, and the wheat, and I want to talk about that, the branding issue here in a little bit, but he also dabbled in some other things there that really sort of, I think, set the the... It, we can look at would have shaped his view of America as a free as a free market economy in, in many ways. Um, what were some of the other things that he had going on uh, at uh, Mount Vernon? Well, one of the things was the um, he's been known as the uh, the fa- the father of American mules because um, he after after when he came back there after after the Revolutionary War after leading the uh, the the America. Uh, the new American forces to, to victory. Um, he had, he had, um, mules were very important and they were being used in Europe as far as they could, you know, they could, to pull the plow, you know, before they had, um, uh, you know, mechanized uh, plows and like uh, automobiles. Um, so he had gotten, a, he had heard about this from some of his European friends, like uh, uh, La, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, who had, who had served with him during during the war, and he had, was able to get like a uh, a Spanish donkey, which he which he which he bred with his his, his mares, and uh, and and start you know that was the genetic engineering of the day that you would spread you would you know a mule is a cross between the donkey and a horse, and he would start you know breeding them and and selling them to different farms, and became introduced mules in America and be, became really the first mule breeder in America. He had a fishery where there were like hundreds of thousands of fish at one point with a, a giant, this is the way, some of the ways he integrated his enterprises, a giant fish net, you know, made in part with some of the hemp that he, that he, that he grew. And he, he would catch from shad and herring, several varieties of the, of, of the fish. And then he would use that, some of the fish guts that they couldn't, you know, sell or couldn't eat for fertilizer on, on the, uh, on, and mixed in with the fertilizer as far as uh, his his wheat and uh, and and uh, and other and other crops. Uh, so the the grist mill, as, as I said, he would he would brand that with the G Washington um, uh, uh, signature. And one of the things I found uh, is that he was a Burgess, which was sort of a, a, a colonial. Uh, repre- representative, the equivalent like of a state representative today of the in the Virginia House of Burgesses. When he was a Burgess, he created a law for anybody if you met certain conditions for flour that you could basically register a trademark. I mean, this was before this was before there was a U.S. government, so any kind of you know like uh, like uh, federal uh, the the U.S. trademark law I don't think would come until a uh, hundred and fifty years later. But he said you could register that as a court with sort of like your unique branding mark and it was open to anybody. It wasn't like, you know, cronyism for himself, but as soon as he, as soon as that became law, he made that and he registered the G Washington sort of trademarked that and was able to ship there to, uh, uh, through the colonies, you know, back to great Britain. And then at the, at the British, at the British West Indies. So he was a pioneer in, in branding, both in, you know, in policy making and in, uh, in 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 utilize in utilizing the practice, and then after the when he came back after he was president, on the advice of his Scottish farm manager and uh, an Irish Catholic friend who had served under him in the war, uh, John Fitzgerald, he built a whiskey distillery, which became one of the largest whiskey distilleries in the U.S. And now Mount Vernon has recently rebuilt. Yeah, that is. It. Let's let's take this branding for a second. How I mean, just think about that for a second. How much ahead of his time, uh, you know, today, you know, everybody wants to know the, you know, the, the local grown sourcing, where it comes from and everything. Just think about how much George Washington was ahead of his time in marketing, taking the G Washington. So yeah, we know it's coming from Mount Vernon. We know it's coming from him. And, and, and really in a way though, playing off of his own popularity. I think so. Well, 
It's 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 very interesting as far as what th- th- that's that's a, that's a great point, but it's very interesting what led to his own popularity. It's it's always been sort of a mystery about how all the members of the Continental Congress in say around 1775 chose him on his on the first ballot to become general when you know you didn't have mass communications you didn't know you know you couldn't look up somebody in on, on the on the on the on the internet adams he had adams support but i was looking but how did adams convince the others one of the things i was looking at what adams said that's about the only thing we have recorded is um, of all the other things he mentions george washington's service in the french and indian war but also has says something about his independent fortune so it's sort of my theory and i think more research needs to be done about that that Washington building his reputation through the flower, which he would have done for a, uh, about a few years, and people in other colonies becoming familiar with it, becoming familiar with the fine quality and the G. Washington brand on it, got to know him that way and thought, you know, because he was able, because Adam specifically, Adam specifically mentioned his independent fortune, was able to, his, I think his business acumen actually helped make his reputation and was may have been in some ways responsible for him being chosen as general wow well you know and, and but that seems to play out uh, uh, even to today i mean if it's the idea well if you can you know if you're a successful entrepreneur you must be successful in other things as well because of what's going on but that is interesting to see because adam's coming from a completely different background uh than uh than you know that era with washington but washington branding it out as it comes um you've brought up the distillery and this is an issue I, it's amazing how it was not until and i have to be very open it probably wasn't up until about 15 20 years ago that i realized or had known that he had one of the largest distilleries in the country and not because i don't think i had never heard it but it was never emphasized in stories about george washington um, that is that is so true. I mean, I didn't know it until really Mount Vernon rebuilt it, and that was in fact what gave me the interest in the in the first writing about Washington. I, after I found out about that, I looked at his other businesses, and that was what gave me interest in in writing about him. But with Washington, the truth is just um, uh, so much more interesting, I think, and that that than the myth. I mean, which is more interesting, the story, the legend that's probably not true that he. Uh, chopped down a, a cherry tree or that he built a greenhouse to plant orange and lemon trees or build a or build a whiskey distillery so that's the thing and that was the motivation in writing and i wanted to get washington you know make him as show his greatness but show how he was relatable to uh to entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs today and what we can learn from him now Let's dig, let's dig into the distillery for a second because it is an unknown kind of quantity and it does it brings this back. I mean, we know about the flower, you know about the branding. Did he carry over the branding into the distillery? Uh, how did he get? I mean, you talked about a couple of his friends who talked him into it. What uh, sort of describe that? How it built up and, and uh, how it went. Well, it was actually after he was president, um, and he in the last. Um, two and a half years of, of his of his life. He came back to Mount Vernon in 1797, and both times he came back, he, he you know, it, he sort of needed to uh, rebuild because there's only so much you can, I mean, if you're absent now from a, from a piece of land that, you know, you, you, you might, you, you own, you might get some breakdown, but imagine, you know, doing it without, uh, uh, <laughs> without what we're doing, we're doing now as far as, you know, video chatting, other other things. Although we had competent farm managers, there's nothing like having, you know, the the owner back there. So his farm manager, who was from Scotland, James Anderson, said, you know, that you, you know, you're growing wheat, you know, again, it was integrating pro- products, you know, you might want to try a whiskey distillery. And Washington wrote to his friend, um, uh, John Fitzgerald, who served as a, as a colonel right under him as a war, as an aide de camp, um, and then Fitzgerald himself, uh, I write, you know, in, 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 the, in, the, in the book, in George Washington Entrepreneur, was a successful entrepreneur, was a, sold rum and many other types of merchandise um, 
in, in Alexandria. He was also active in building the first Catholic church in, Vir in Virginia, which Washington, and there's evidence, there's, I think there's strong evidence that Washington even helped out with, you know, gave money for the, uh, for the, for the church, even though he wasn't, uh, even though Washington wasn't Catholic. So he wrote to Fitzgerald, which being from Ireland, he thought he might know something about whiskey. And Fitzgerald said, it's, oh, it's a great idea. So Washington, uh, Washington built it, and it was you know they now Mount Vernon has, has has rebuilt it, and they actually sell some of his whiskey. They have uh, like a license from like an ABC license from Virginia to do that. It's straight rye whiskey, and it just uh, it became some of the top selling uh, whiskey in the country, and I think you know pioneered a large scale operation, which Jack Daniel and and others you know may have learned from. Yeah, because it would have been predating a lot of that. The, the question was, did so they did the distillery there on Mount Vernon itself, correct? It is. It's on Mount Vernon itself. Now, what's interesting when they they rebuilt it on the same land, but it's it's adjoining the modern Mount Vernon because Mount Vernon was actually five farms. The Mount Vernon and some of those were sold off. Some of those have houses on 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 them uh, uh, them uh, today. I know people who live on the original Mount Vernon land. So the Mount Vernon that has been preserved by the Ladies League of Mount Vernon, by some ladies in 1850 in the 1850s who didn't like it going into uh, to disrepair, which is itself a great entrepreneurial story, um, is is like his main farm, the mansion house, and where he lived. There are like were four other farms where that land is being utilized, you know, by other people. But the whiskey distillery, they were able to get some of the original land, but it's not, if you go there today, it's not connected to the main Mount Vernon house and you need, you have to take it, you have to take a shuttle, but it's still great that the, that the Ladies League of Mount Vernon was able, was able to do this. And they're a very entrepreneurial, Mount Vernon, I've spoken there a couple of times, is a very entrepreneurial organization no government no government funding so i would encourage everyone to visit to visit there it, it is a neat place and, and that's it now in looking at that let, let's uh, you've hit on something that's interesting and i want to get back to the distillery in just a second um as far as staying you know a lot of times we'll see these you know over the years it stays within the family but then moves out of the family you know or, or gets sold off how did that transition because there was that time when, when mount vernon could have been lost forever it really was that that family had a hard time keeping up with it, and Washington also had, you know, this is, uh, I think, in one of his one of his other signs of, you know, just the nobility, he had uh, freed all of his all of the slaves that he he owned in in his in his will, so they, you know, um, uh, the the family did not have, and and task his family with actually caring for a, a lot of them in their in their old age, so. That was so. Th so they were. They had. You know that sort of. Um, uh, um, uh, um, what was a financial disadvantage in the in the day, and also just keeping keeping up Mount Vernon because even then it was it was it was a sh um, uh, it, it was it was a shrine a, sh a, shr a shrine and people would come to visit it in Washington's own lifetime. So a woman, um, uh, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Cunningham. Um, uh, I believe it, and Pamela Cunning, uh, Cunningham uh, just saw it like on a boat ride past Ma Mount Vernon, and it was in the 1850s and was falling into disrepair. And she says, if the men can't do this, we will. So she raised money. She bought it from the Washington heir that was, that was, that was having it then, and they just did an amazing job before there was any type of national park system. I mean, it's just as a private organization pioneering historical preservation. And there are some great stories in the early Mount Vernon about how it was Thomas Edison personally outfitted it with electricity. Um, uh, Henry Ford uh, visited with his wife and then gave them their first ca car. So it has, you know, Washington himself was an entrepreneur and Mount Vernon has always, you know, been a magnet that has drawn entrepreneurs that have uh, helped out with, and continued with its with its growth and its preservation. That is, now is now it's my understanding. I may I may be wrong. The Mount Vernon itself is still under this foundation. It is not part of or is it part of the National Park Service? It is not. That's the what Ladies I thought. League of Mount Vernon still owns it. It takes it takes it takes no government funding. <laughs> and that's probably why if you go out there, it is immaculately kept. And um, it, it's really a really amazing kind of place. 
to look at. That is interesting to see how that the people took that up, that calls up, and in that true entrepreneurial spirit, you know, kept it going. Back to the distillery for a minute because I think it's fascinating to a lot of people who maybe listen to this podcast for the first time and and didn't realize that that this was a part of you know Washington's life. Um, They've now rebuilt this distillery, or at least producing again. Are they using the original recipes? I mean, what was? How did they they come up with this, or is this just a? Are they just using the name, if you would? No, they as close as they can. They are using the the original recipes when practical. I mean, there may be an ingredient that's not that's not as available, or they may put some things in to make it to make it safer. I, in fact, I know they probably probably do. It's very safe. So so that's uh, as as safe as whiskey can can be with a, if you drink it, you know, <laughs> moderately, but uh the um uh, uh but they still basically use the same operation with the kind of, you know, with the with the with the water wheel and the and the and, and the that they, and that they that they they use to power it. it it's right next to the they've also rebuilt the grist mill the flour mill and still make some flour there too but they basically use the you know the water power with the water with the with the water wheel that was why it was so important and washington loved mount vernon so much that it was the the Proto- from the potomac and they still have some of the french burr stones that he uh he used he used for that i mean they really they actually had um archaeologists uh uh, actually look, um, explore the land and, and find, you know, as much as they could of what, what was in the old distillery, which I believe was partly destroyed by, uh, by a fire and, uh, and, and, and re and rebuild from there. How long was the original distillery operating after? Cause you, it was in the last, you said couple of years of his life. Did they operate it after his death? I think like until the, um, 18, 18- like around 1815 or, or 1820s, but, um, it, yeah, it was, it was for like about 20 years after it, after his life, but then it just sort of went, you know, uh, I think there was, there was a fire and it went by, by the, by the way, by the wayside. Yeah. Well, most people, again, if you've never been to Mount Vernon, you've only heard about it, you know, it, 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 what you just said about it being on the Potomac, it is literally on the Potomac. And, uh, if you're flying in, if you're ever flying in and coming in, from what they call the Southern Approach into National Airport, you can you, you get a chance you can see it uh, as you're coming up the uh, the pathway there because the Potomac was so important to him with his livestock, the fishing, and, and everything else going on. The now all of the process that you know it's interesting to me. This is sort of intertwined: the man, the entrepreneur, the the business person. Now you have the 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 league that keeps it up is is reinvesting that entrepreneurial spirit with the whiskey and the grist mill and the flour. All of that goes back into keeping up the 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 estate, correct? Yes, yes, it does. In fact, if you go to the Mount Vernon restaurant, you can get some of the um, uh, um you can get like some I believe grits and other and other and other things that were that were in. Um, and some bread that is, that is actually from, uh, you have, you have food that comes, that, uh, that comes from the Mount, the Mount Vernon, the Mount Vernon farm. So, um, so it's, so it's, you know, you could actually, you could literally, they literally serve it, serve it in the restaurant there. And I believe they sell it to, to other places too. So it's a working farm. I mean, relies a lot on, uh, on individual and, and business and, uh, and business donations is very entre- entrepreneurial as far as the way it's, it's, uh, philanthropic arm works, but it's it's very much an entrepreneurial, self-sustaining organization that uh, George Washington would be proud of. Well, and I think that's the the interesting thing, you know, is he made, you know, his, his fortune, he gave to his country. It, if you were to look at that entrepreneurial spirit, especially that trademarking and, and the other part there, um, he had a sense that what was inherently valuable was not only the work, of the hand in the field, but also the, the making of the product, that thought process, you know, I, I think probably come from his engineering or his, his surveyor sort of mentality that the thought process of what makes something work was uh, very special to him. As you know, whether it be in legislator wanting to keep that branding uh, in the constitution where we have, you know, that for a certain amount of time, this is, you know, in the, it enshrined in the constitution, that you know the 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 creator's work is protected. Um, I don't think he gets enough credit in many ways for being on the forefront of that. Washington, I mean, inventors um, uh, were look. One of the things in my book is, and I quote uh, professors like Theodore McCloskey and others, 
inventors before America was created um, uh, were sort of looked at as freaks and crackpots, and Washington helped create the atmosphere where inventors like Addison, like excuse me, like Edison and Alexander Graham Bell were actually were revered. Washington went out of his way, both as president and private citizen, to champion inventors. When he was going to uh, uh, West uh, um, uh, Western Virginia, you know what's now West Virginia, Shepherd's Shepherdstown, um, he met a gentleman named James Rumsey who was experimenting with boats, and people thought he was a crackpot and. Uh, he gave, he actually championed Rumsey's mechanical boat as far as, um, and and uh, pushed for the Virginia, there weren't federal, there wasn't a federal government, so there weren't uh, uh, federal uh, patents at, at the time, but he pushed uh, for Virginia and Maryland to give Rumsey a state, a state patent, and Rumsey would later um, uh, invent, is considered the co-inventor of the steamboat, um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, Robert Fulton would commercialize it like just like Henry Ford did with a car uh, twenty years later, which was a great achievement. But Rumsey was actually one of the one of the uh, original original inventors. And under Washington's administration, when he signed the Patent Act, and I believe signed some patents himself, um, uh, Rums, uh, Rumsey and a, and a guy named uh, named Cook were given the patent for the first steamboat. So very much was, and he talked about the importance of having. Of, of having inventors here. In fact, he was so, he welcomed, like, say, French balloonists, and uh, he was so fascinated with the hot air balloon that could take up someone in the air for a short time. He wrote that one day they might be coming from Paris by, quote, flying through the air instead of plowing the ocean. So he could even see, like, before railroads were even invented, like, the potential of something like commercial air travel. Wow. You know, it, it makes a, a difference. And, and back then, if you look at a lot of the founding fathers, they were, uh, you know, very, many were entrepreneurial. Many were, were scholars. I mean, you look at Jefferson, you look at uh, Madison, you look at Adams, you look at the, the, many of these and the way they come about. Jefferson, and, and I don't, I'm not sure if you may agree or not, but Jefferson's similar in that Washington mode of, of entrepreneurial, arc, you know, that the attention to detail and others. What do you think, and again, just as we look at President's Day, we talk about looking back at Lincoln and Washington and all these, but Washington in particular, having that, and we know that he had that interest in his home and business in Mount Vernon while he was president. Do you think that the idea to him of what we have known today is becoming more of a government or an employee? I don't want to say an employee because me being in, I've been in Congress and been in others. You go when you serve, you come home. Would he be amazed today at how we basically have separated out our national leaders many times into what that's all that they do with many times no connection back to a business point? I think I think he would, and I think he would be he would be dis he would be disappointed by that. Yes, I mean a bunch of the founding fathers that you know certainly Jefferson, Jefferson and Franklin are sort of known, by, I think, for some of their innovation and entrepreneurialism. Washington is was is sort of seen as more of the face of the, the dollar. People revere him, but don't always can't always relate to him, and that's sort of and that is you know why I wrote you know uh, George George Washington uh, entrepreneur. But that's a, a characteristic of a lot of the founding fathers. Um, Patrick Henry was sort it was uh, had a successful farm and it was sort of like the Alan Dershowitz of his day. He would do everything in his law practice from tax cases to murder trials. So I'm and and then you had Robert Livingston, who I mentioned Fulton was actually sort of like served as a venture capitalist to, to Fulton and putting up some of the funding. And, you know, Livingston also was, a, of course, a scientist signer and one of the drafters of the Declaration of Independence. So you had a lot of creative endeavors by the founding fathers, and that may very well be the subject of my next book. Well, I think it is an interesting you know, point of view because I think, and it goes to today, you know, as we look at this, John, I think the interesting thing for me is our country is at a, and this brings us to modern times a little bit as we talk about President's Day, we talk about George Washington, Ontario. Is there a concern and I'm not saying overwhelming concern, but you know, for the first time in the last 20 years, 25 years, you've had honest, I'll call it honest discussion in government and other places of the role of the entrepreneur, the role of our, our quote, free market economy and the government interaction and interdiction into that. Um, our country was started on that, those principles. Okay. Is there a concern today that we could look back and hopefully you writing more about this would help that, 
it is that basis that really started and, and sustained our country for so long and that by leaving it we're leaving sort of the founding roots of who we are as a country I mean it is it is a very it is a very strong cons- uh, concern I, I wrote this book and to show to further show how with Washington himself we are rooted in entrepreneurship and Washington read Adam Smith and the more we are getting away from that the more we're getting away that that from the country that Washington built I mean built for uh built for everybody. So um, uh, I quote some of Washington's warnings, actually, in his farewell address, which is most known for what he said on foreign foreign policy, which was very wise. But he also, Washington, in that amazingly sort of predicted the the um, uh, the, administ- the administrative state or where one branch of government will aggregate, aggrandize power from the other branches and, and warn that we should keep watch of that. So we need to, I don't think he would like some of the, some of the things where, you know, agencies, you know, could act without authorization of, of law. I know he wouldn't like it. So, uh, we need to, we need to very much, uh, watch that, that, uh, a, a agencies, you know, stick to their constitutional spheres and that they don't, uh, you know, kill the entrepreneurship that, you know, started with George Washington. <laughs> One of the things that you just brought up that is so you know troubling to me is exactly you know in his farewell address he talked about the administrative. Thing. There's been two presidents who, and in my mind, who have give final speeches, if you were their final sage to the country, if you, in that way, that have been you know, predictive as much as they were poignant at the time, and that was Washington's, of course, with the administrative state, with the growth of government, and it being becoming unbalanced. I do believe it is unbalanced. As someone who served in Congress uh, and saw it up close, I believe that we are, if there was, you know, it's supposed to be all sort of the equals, the thirds, you know, the the executive and judicial and legislative. And now I believe the executive is, is unfortunately has pushed up leading to this kind of bureaucratic uh, state that we're in. The other one is of course, Eisenhower who predicted the, you know, the rise of the military industrial complex. And we're seeing that today. Um, in getting back to our entrepreneurial roots, seeing people like Washington, I think, don't you believe that in some ways we could, this could be uh, the, the new teaching of Washington in our schools instead of just the, the general and the, the first president and say, look, here is, uh, here's an entrepreneur who, who had a well-rounded life. Very much so. And I, I, I hope, I hope it's, it's very much. I've actually talked to, um, you know, given uh, talked about my book both with my niece and nephew and with with some other uh uh, k- uh kids and and they seem very they seem very interested they're budding entrepreneurs themselves so yes definitely this is the this is the picture of george uh of george washington that we should we should uh teach that the truth is is i can understand i can understand how the cherry tree may have you know showed that he was you know he was a he was a, he was a, he was a good man but this just this shows that also that he's a good man but the real man and how both everyone from you know from kids to adult can sort of relate to uh to his struggles and triumphs it is well i think you know there's this uh saying going around now now we see it in the super bowl and everyone has the the old quote from fortune favors the bold um, I think that would be very much applicable to George Washington because he was he was outspoken, he was bold. He may not have been the 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 flashiest of the founding fathers, but he was the one that that was taking you know measure. And I think that that quote you gave earlier about Adams and, and that personal uh, wealth, if you would, really speaks to that. And that he had a standing among his peers because of the non-singular focus of his life, but a rounded focus in his life. Yes, yes. And, and the for, the idea that fortune favors of the bold, which was recently in a cryptocurrency ad, um, uh, was actually, has actually been, been criticized by, by some, you know, leftist uh, paternalists like Tim Noah at, uh, at Slate, who said, oh, this is terrible. It'll make people, you know, being, you know, will invest in cryptocurrency and they may lose some things. I mean, it's, isn't that better? than people just uh you do it spending I mean, if you're talking about a couple hundred dollars and going to the casino so i have a whole blog at, at cei.org about actually what washington would have thought about cryptocurrency and why some of the properties wouldn't be that you know un, unfamiliar with him as far as encryption which he 
he used an invisible ink and you know ciphers with uh, with codes and keys and things like that with his with his actually with his spies during the Revolutionary War. So he, the the founders would know they were smart guys. They would know some things about encryption and about ledgers, and they also would be familiar with alternative money because one of the things in the colonies they used were tobacco warehouse receipts, were kind of circulated as as money. So uh, it's. Uh, it's it's something they would know a, a lot because they're sort of even about what seem about the most sophisticated modern technologies here. Well, who would have known it here on President's Day as we talk uh, about this? You know, Washington being the first techie. You know, <laughs> we look at it in a different way. Um, again, though, as we as we sort of sum up here, if you were looking back and and you were telling a group of, and let's just go high schoolers because I believe right now our high schools. Are, are missing some of this uh, historical basis for a lot of our what our country is coming into. What we, and they said, what is the thing that you learn most about George Washington in writing this book? What would it be? The thing that he learned, I learned most was that was that he was uh, he was more like us than we would think, as far as you know, being uh, having entrepreneurs and ambitions in in uh, in his in his. Uh, in in his life and having and having and having dis disappointments that uh, he was a great man but also had some very rela rela relatable struggles and just I think in reading his writing just how um, uh, human he was like there was one thing as I mentioned people were going to Mount Vernon and he talked about and he wrote back to his farm manager that you know give everyone you know hospitality that they go there but don't give them the fancy Madeira. Um, uh, uh, wine, give them the Clarat. So I, I sort of wrote, you know, he would, he would love today having like two buck chalk. Uh, so but that's the thing. He was, he was, he was thinking, you know, of, of like, you know, how to just ab about the things, you know, about how to, how to watch expenses and other things. And I think if you see that, you know, from being, you know, um, um, human, right. Then, you know, as, as great as he was, you know, nobody's a, a, um, a, a God and Washington certainly would believe that, you know, that he's, you know, only human and flawed. And you know, with was thanking, uh, pro, as he put it, providence. You know, for God all the time that you can that you can you can relate to him more and and be in your life more like George Washington and use him as a mentor, not just how the country should be run, but how your life should be run. Uh, it, I think such valuable lesson. Tell us, uh, tell our podcast listeners again uh, the name of your book and where they can get it. George Washington Entrepreneur. Available in all the places you buy books, um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Uh, you uh, if you can ask for it at your at your local bookstore, but just any book site should have it, and then ask for it at your at your local at your local bookstore. George Washington, entrepreneur, published by St. Martin's Press. All right, John Burlow here with us today, talking on President's Day about uh, our founding president, George Washington, but doing it from a different perspective, talking about the entrepreneurial uh, interest of George Washington, which has really laid the foundation for so many things in our country uh, that if we ever get away from, then we, is the old biblical term, we become like every other nation. And I think we can't go away from that entrepreneurial, innovative spirit that was so uh, prevalent in George Washington. John, thank you for being with me today. Congressman Collins, thank you so much for having me. If people want to see some of my other work about uh, cryptocurrency, financial re regulation, the red tape on community banks. Um, it's at cei.org is the website for my uh, the organization I'm, I, I, I work at, the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Hey everybody, it's Doug Collins. I can't wait to tell you about a new partner here on the Doug Collins Podcast, Healthy Cell. HealthyCell.com, you can go to, to their website. They are reimagining the way that we take vitamins. I mean, look, you don't still listen, you know, for the most part, record players are for the vintage side. You look at for, for old time, you don't listen for the crispest, clear. There's things out there that you get right now that have updated in the future. And we're still taking vitamins like we did back in the 1930s. This new technology, this new product from Healthy Cell is a micro gel that takes your vitamins, puts them in a gel form. You can take it straight out of the pack. You can mix it in water or, or your favorite food, but it gets into your system so much quicker. 165% better absorption through this micro gel technology. And believe me, the more you get in the nutrients into your body, the better you're going to be. They have a full product line. I take these medicine, these this uh, pack, these meta gel packets. They are amazing. Uh, we have been on them now for a little over a month and I can tell the biggest difference. I've taken vitamins most of my adult life and the 
way these work is just something that I don't think that you can find anywhere else. Again, it's healthycell.com. You can go forward slash Collins or use Collins in the promo code uh, to get a 20% discount. You don't want to miss this. Please go check out their website, healthycell.com, microgel for these vitamins that are the best thing out there right now to keep you healthy and listening to the Doug Collins podcast. Folks, I don't know about you, but I cannot stand a towel that simply moves water around me after my shower. I like a towel that grabs you, takes the water, gets it off of you, and does what a towel's supposed to do, dry you off. I've had so many towels I bought over time. Some some are expensive, some were cheap, but again, when they just sort of move the water around, I could have just stayed in the shower and stayed wet. I need a towel that gets me dry. That's where our friends at MyPillow uh, come in. They have towels and you're not gonna believe the bargain that they have right now. Uh, Mike and the folks at MyPillow have offered a six-piece towel set. That's two bath towels, two hand towels, and two washcloths. Regularly $109.99 for $39.99. All you gotta do is have code word Collins. Uh, you can go to MyPillow.com or you can call them at 1-800-986-3994. Uh, if you want towels that actually do what they're supposed to do, dry you off. You know, that's what we do here on the Doug Collins Podcast. We talk about real answers and real solutions for a complicated world. Well, sometimes you may not think that getting water off of you is a complicated process, but undoubtedly it is for some towel companies. It's not for the folks at my pillow who actually have a towel to my towel, which is a great investment for you. And right now you can get it on sale regularly $109.99 for only $39.99 and that is with code word Collins. Also, anything else that you want to go on there, you can still got the slippers, you still got the my pillows, you still got everything that uh, is uh, on that wonderful website. You want to go check it out. Use code name Collins and get your discounts. Folks at MyPillow are waiting on you right now. 